God damn. Well, it's time bring, for bring another mutilator up. moment. Maybe God. have a screaming baby sound. Oh my God. Uh, and and it's that screaming it. baby sound. And it's you, the you, mutilator you moment. You have to present it like dead ass serious. Like it's not a joke because it's not a joke. Like you're presenting it. It's like a dead ass serious news segment type of thing where you just identify someone. and uh, Breaking news. Yeah, We're having a mutilator moment. <laughs> ah! And it's... Uh, and that screaming sound means it's a mutilator moment. All right. Do we want to like focus, introduce the? Where we get to focus on a identified mutilator, like Pollock, like the, you know, put all, and that way when the podcast goes out, all his contact information and profile information that's publicly available will be hashtagged, so it can channel it to him. Some of us circumcised guys might go through a secondhand trauma from. <laughs> Maybe, hey, you know. So be it, Yeah, you know. The mother people that are forgetting about these crimes happening every second, every moment. That's my, that's my take here. I, I want to drag, I want to uncover them, expose them for who they are. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think this is, like, totally wrong, and anyone doing it, like, can clearly, like, as a person could maybe see objectively see that what they're doing is not okay but you know it's just perpetuated by society i feel like and all these messed up values that people just carry on I don't know. well do we want to introduce this topic sort of um oh i'm gonna have to step out are, are you gonna are you, gone, are, are you leaving now the for the entirety of the call Oh, all right okay well, uh, and we'll exit stage low all right um well anyways i just want to give a little brief introduction because we have a new guest on our podcast today um yeah um my name is nick welcome to the third installation of the intactivist podcast today um we're just sort of talking about uh whatever like restorative justice mainly and things of that nature Cole. Oh, are we all introducing ourselves? Or do you want to introduce yourself? I don't know. Why not? Yeah, I'm Carter Steinhoff. Um, I'm going to be primarily speaking about restorative justice today, but I'll hop in on any topic. That sounds yeah, I'm good. Tom Maple. Thanks, Tom, for joining, and I and I really am excited to feature you on my podcast. It's a pleasure. Well, thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. Glad to, glad to be here. Um, I thought your story was, like, pretty interesting when I first met you. Um, yeah. Um, the restorative justice. Do you want to sort of explain what you mean by that? Sure, yeah. So there's another concept that I want to present, and that's related to um, truth and reconciliation. And the only time that I've heard this term reference, truth and reconciliation, is in the context of South Africa, uh, which I haven't really looked into in, you know, to the depth that I should have at this point. But to the best of my knowledge, I know that the federal government in South Africa um, initiated a policy called truth and reconciliation or the, the that's what the process was referred to as and the federal government investigated some um human rights violation that took place and then so that's like the truth part right they discovered and um spoke with the victims involved and looked into this and gave a detailed summary of, of their accounts and it wasn't you know some bs process where they were trying to um, just cover everything up. They, they really went and investigated this and, and to you know the best of their ability, got understood the gravity of the situation and accounted for everything. And then they implemented the reconciliation part of that, which is a restorative justice component of the plan where they began allotting 
I believe just direct monetary compensation for the um, human rights violations that took place during that time. And so I'm advocating for a similar policy to be implemented at the federal and state level with, within the United States. And I haven't really fleshed out 100% you know, the argument that I like to present, um, but I'm working through it in my mind right now. And so I'll break down where I'm at in this moment in time. My thought and why, why I believe this is justified in, in the case of routine infant circumcision. And if you were a man who was, um, you know, had a penile modification as an infant, or really, if honestly, if you're a, a woman, a man, an intersex individual who had a genital modification surgery as, as a child that wasn't for dire medical need, like gangrene or frostbite, right, or something that really actually requires that tissue is removed from your genitals, um, you should be, not only should, you know, this be investigated by the federal government on your behalf, because they created the framework that allowed this to even take place. They provided a framework, a legal, logical, ethical, moral framework. They fostered all of this and created an environment in which it is permissible and in some cases, even encouraged to perform tissue removal surgeries on children's genitals in mass. I mean, this sounds like something out of a dystopian future or something like that, but that's actually the reality, unfortunately, that we live in right now. And um, this isn't really on people's radar in any way, shape or form. I'm definitely trying to change that along with a lot of other people. Um, but I just don't think that, um, the reason this sounds so far-fetched right now, the reason that f monetary federal aid sounds far-fetched uh, from and state aid as well towards restorative justice is because people can't really comprehend the gravity of the situation here. Um, and it's really hard to paint that picture for them. But strapping anyone down, whether you're an infant, whether you're a juvenile, whether you're an adult, and performing tissue removal surgeries. First of all, this isn't like any other type of tissue on your body. So I, I, you have to go through this long process to get somebody to the point where they can understand why the consequences of this are so severe. So not only, this isn't like tissue on any other part of your body, really. And that's, that's the first common misunderstanding that people have is they think it's like, just skin, right? You hear it commonly referred to as extra skin. Well, no other skin on my body is erotically charged or is erogenous, right? I can't stimulate my, you know, face right here and feel erotic sensations. So this is your first hint. And they, I'm not sure if they even know that this tissue that's ablated from the penis is erotically charged like that, the common person who's doing this to a child or the physician, I'm not entirely sure if they're fully aware. Some definitely probably are. Um, and really the, the American public at large in certain areas of the world, um, certain cultures and communities, I'm not sure they understand the significance of this tissue and the properties of this tissue, why, why it's so valuable to a human being. Um, is because it has like this potent erogenous capacity where it can, when it, upon stimulation, it stimulates your neurotransmitters and produces, um, you know, what we call pleasurable feelings. And this is like a precious human feeling that you can have. This is a sense that you have. This is something so valuable to human beings it's it's just like eyesight and other and other senses right erotic sensations are so important to us and we we've made it out to be this really weird thing but at the end of the day it's really just a sensation right it's a sensation that is a drug like experience for you right it's the only like natural human drug like experience that you can have and um it's healthy for like it's a good thing for you. It's it's this very unique facet of hum of of the human experience of you know being a human being, and that is partially or fully being taken from children in mass in this country. They are strapping them down, 
and performing penile modification surgeries that excise generous amounts of the erotically charged tissue and the functional tissue. It's not just that it's, it's erogenous in its own right. It has a strong functional purpose. It's like the primary stimulatory mechanism for the penis as well. So you stimulate the entirety of the organ with this mucosal membrane erotically charged sleeve of tissue that stimulates the glands and the shaft and really the tissue they removed is the shaft tissue if you were to pull it back all the way you could go to the base of the penis with erotically charged tissue now most circumcised men know that they're not that's not where they're at and if people are familiar with the coverage index you know if you're at that c1 c2 level to the best of my understanding, you've had like 70% of that mucosal membrane tissue or more removed from your penis. That's not a trivial operation. That's an atrocity. And that's a radical operation that has totally changed your sexual organ. And if you are comfortable with that having had happened to you as a child, I want to have a conversation with you. I don't believe that's appropriate to feel that way in any way, shape or form. And I'm taking a stand on that. That That's not permissible to, to believe that it is acceptable that you were strapped down and heinously tortured, first of all. This is not like, you know, this minor operation. What I've seen is like something out of a Saw movie, right? I went out of my way not to watch one, two, three, four, five infant circumcision videos, but probably every one that exists on YouTube. And the conclusion that I came to in the end is this is some sick, sadistic, sadistic torture of a fragile juvenile that defiles them in the most perverse and sickening of ways possible. It has ripped my mind in half watching these videos. And if anyone doubts me, right, if there you doubt me with or any of us with a frack, but even you know, a fraction of a grain of rice of doubt in your mind, then you need to view, then I need to share with you the evidence that I've acquired. Because this is going to put all the doubt away. Every doubt that you have will dissipate immediately when you see the evidence that I've acquired. And if it doesn't, then we have a totally different problem here. Because um, this is so clear, so clear, like if somebody was trying to convince an atheist that Jesus was real and they had 4K video evidence of Jesus performing miracles, thousands of miracles around the world. That's the type of evidence that I have that infant circumcision is a crime of the highest possible caliber and a violation and it's torturous to an infant. That's the type of evidence that I have. So if anyone doubts me, um, let me present what I've, what I've acquired. You know, the, the, the burden of evidence, the burden of proof is on me, and I have it. So I need to be allowed to present it. Anyway, went off on a little bit of a tangent there, <laughs> like I normally do. But this gets back to originally what I want to discuss here is before I can really begin pursuing this truth and reconciliation process, there has to be a major leap in awareness among the general American public here um, so I can begin to convey, you know, the gravity, like I've said, of, of the situation here, that this isn't like, um, you know, I didn't have the right to vote or I couldn't use the same drinking fountain as someone else, right? Those are serious civil rights violations. Absolutely. Without any shadow of a doubt. This is something different, though. This is, I was heinously tortured and permanently mutilated and I have no avenue for legal recourse because the system that I live in not only permitted this to happen, but then gave me no ability to, no framework to pursue legal justice. So I don't really feel like a citizen of this country and a policy change and an apology is never gonna be enough for me, right? That's not enough you know, to reconcile the atrocity that was committed against me and any other man involved in this. So I don't know why I'm paying taxes. I don't know why I'm a part of this society when the first reason you are a part of a society is for physical protection. 
that's the first reason why you subscribe to being civil and being in a society is because you you know they got your back man they got your back no one they did not have my back there that is the opposite that is the worst possible thing that could have been done to me at the most fragile time of my life all right well i'll end on that because i just dominated like 20 minutes of the conversation but you're good i think a lot of the issues that I face as an intactivist, um, when I when I do express these concerns about circumcision, is like major denial uh, and like just total shock, honestly, because these people like have not really cared or thought about like the foreskin like this as we do. I mean, it's it's just weird because you get to see their reaction and it's like when I go out and do these protests or whatever it's like you you see their reaction and then they sort of have to digest this like sort of cruel and sort of hard to digest information I don't know it's it's interesting but I I feel a little bit frustrated in that aspect of intactivism right now um I don't know yeah no I definitely hear you I would be so great if we had resources that were able to convey the situation, right? If we could just right now, there's nothing like that I can share with someone that really except like an infant circumcision video, but it's not really diplomatic or in your best interest to share something like that in most environments. So um, I found that that is a huge that's something that we're really lacking right now. I don't really consider myself an intactivist to be 100% honest with you. I have my own brand, um, my own personal brand, right? And that's that's what I align myself with. That's where my allegiance lies. It's really just with myself um, for the time being. But I do align with a lot of what intactivists um, share or, or how they feel and, and what, what their viewpoints are. Um, but... And so with that, with that being said, um, I think right now that the intactivist movement is lacking in a lot of areas. And I don't mean to say this in a way that's belittling. I'm trying to provide like constructive criticism. And really, I feel like when you provide constructive criticism, um, if you don't have much to offer, then you need to do it in a certain way, right? Because I'm attempting to... Um, make up for or inject kind of my own expertise into the intactivist movement um, to, to try to kind of make up for some of these shortcomings right now. One of the serious shortcomings is we don't have many assets available to distribute among intactivists and individuals who may be, you know, the general public and things like that. And these and the materials we do have don't convey any sense of authority at all. The, the logical arguments are oftentimes, uh, you know, I honestly, I haven't br browsed enough uh, all of the material to make an absolute claim like this, but I, I just don't think that they're, um, the logical side of things might be there, but oftentimes when I go to these web resources, for example, web pages, things like that, the user interface is very outdated. Um, it displays just walls of text, right? Very, very long walls of text that maybe sometimes have references, maybe sometimes they don't. But I can't like distribute and share this material with the average person and expect them to digest this incredibly long form piece of content. Um, and so getting, you know, different assets, maybe graphical assets, um, vid short videos, things like that, that can be distributable um, to others is a major sore point right now um, that needs to be made, you know, we need to rectify that that situation. Um, but there's a lot of other areas as well. But I, I hear what you're saying, Nick, that it's difficult. Where do you, what direction do you point someone in? That's what I always struggle with too. It's like, mm -hmm. if you wanna learn more, where do you go? What's the next step? Yeah, I, I completely agree with you on the whole website thing. I've definitely, like, in my research, like, when I first discovered uh, this, like, whole foreskin restoration thing, like, I was super skeptical of it just because of how the websites looked, and, like, I just did not trust it. I mean, 
it's, right <laughs> it was like sort of looking at um like a time machine i don't know yeah yeah and i'm gonna take a step back for a minute and let some other people talk but there's one other thing that i want to add and that's that right now i'm actually working on it doesn't really cover everything that we just went over there but it's a step in the right direction potentially so um you know my profession is web development so i'm interested in utilizing that experience that i have and that expertise that i have for intactivism related purposes and a tool that i'm creating right now with a group with two other people um is the the background behind why we're building this tool is maybe a little much for this conversation right now but essentially it's going to allow a user to search a database of nordic politicians this is specific for a nordic related project um in the nordic region right so denmark finland norway um iceland and there's one other Nordic country that's not coming to my mind right now, but we're working with an organization over there that has a huge data set of tons of Nordic politicians and what their position, all the Nordic politicians or the parliamentary members, I think there's another group in there as well, and um, their position on routine infant circumcision. They asked them like four different questions, right? And then recorded their responses. And so we built a database based off a, a Excel sheet that they sent us. And then we're creating like a data presentation solution for that database. So the components or the user interface of this web page that we're building or website that we're building is, is actually quite simple. It's just gonna, it's essentially a search engine that allows people to very quickly search their candidates um, name they can search by a lot of different parameters. One is the name though. So an individual like in the Nordic region, right, can just search for their candidate's name and it pulls back a profile um, that highlights all their information. And then also what their position was on each one of these important questions that were asked related to routine infant circumcision. And if, um, you know, they answered unfavorably, I, I don't mean to say it, that's not an appropriate way to say it, but if it wasn't, if the position was not um, aligned with the individual who searched this position, then there's a very easy, you know, next steps section of this profile as well, where the individual can like reach out to this parliamentary member directly, you know, we'll include their phone number, their email, blah, blah, blah. And so they can very quickly just go and, um, you know, let their, their voice be known directly to their elected official. And this obviously, this project um, can be converted, you know, the expert, the, the learning experience here, the way that we're building this application, um, this can be applied to many other different um, areas as well, even in the United States, right? And can also be really easily converted into not just a database and data presentation solution for politicians, but um, anyone, right? So Cy, I think it was, maybe it was Skeptic, yeah, Skeptic in here was talking about the mutilator minute or something like that, where you highlight um, somebody who has, you know, performed infant circumcisions or something like that. Well, you could also really easily create a database of individuals who have performed who you know with certainty have performed infant circumcision and create like a search engine for people to very quickly go users to really quickly go and search this database of um practitioners who have performed infant circumcisions and whether they're still doing it you know their location blah 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 all this other different supplementary data and then make it really easy for the user to reach out and contact them directly and, and things like that so um, I think that can be a very valuable tool in order to apply pressure directly to individuals that um, are responsible for this and create and the re individuals responsible for creating or permitting and tolerating a framework that allows this this practice to persist.
I would be totally open to applying that like in the United States when that once that becomes like a popular um you know issue right but as of right now it, it doesn't seem like it's important to people yeah, but, yeah. Uh, you yeah. know well, but in the Nordic region that's Back totally different yeah I, I have a question for Carter sure well we have a staunch human rights ambassador in Denmark yeah, I because saw that. on December 14th, she yeah. tweeted, human rights must be taken seriously. And she applauds Kelly Craft for insisting on having a debate about the effectiveness of the UN Human Rights Council. And within 24 hours, her whole perspective on human rights was totally revealed when she hosted a religious person advocating I was there yeah advocating for genital ritual genital cutting wow which is really a disturbing contradiction yeah i absolutely agree with you. yeah delusional you know uh, america's based on freedom from religion and of religion not imposed religion Especially a religious right, R I T E, which has been um, had an overwhelmingly devastating effect over health and sciences in America and globally. Globally, so. absolutely, yeah. So I think everyone, most people, not everyone, but most people watching this are probably aware of what you're talking about. But maybe Nick can. Uh, edit some of this in post-production here or some or add some link to this yeah i can put a link because because this really is a, a fascinating um development and and i didn't actually know the context that she was um championing human rights right before she hosted um this jewish speaker i'm actually i'm not sure what where he was from he was definitely part of some organization um, but he specifically came to speak on um, religious intolerance and kind of the Jewish perspective on how they feel about the, tr the development within Danish politics and really Europe at large of criminalizing routine infant circumcision or moving in that direction. Right. And um, I was actually really interested to hear what he had to say. Obviously, I don't agree with him, but I but he was so I was fascinated that he really understood, um, at least it appeared to he really understood at a very deep level where intactivists were coming from. And at the same time, he still disagreed with I don't know. I mean, he didn't really reveal his opinion, but we probably know where he stands. But I didn't know that. Um, you know, there was that much understanding on, on the other side. And that, that almost like kind of disturbed me that they were that aware of our points of discussion and still chose kind of what I believe to be the wrong side of the equation here. Um, and that so that was a very interesting conversation it wasn't really a conversation. It was him giving a lecture. I wish it was more of a conversation and it should have been, it should have been open dialogue where anyone could have spoken, but it was just him giving a lecture to a group of nearly all intactivists. Everyone there was an, his whole audience was intactivists. Well, hey, it's, can I interrupt you there? Sure. It, it, it's curious you, you bring that up. Um, under the 14th amendment, we have an equal protection clause. Mm -hmm. And being as, as our ambassador in Denmark hosted a religious speaker under the seal of the United States of America, leaning pressure on the small nation of Denmark to not protect all their citizens equally, um, I believe that we have standing to appeal to have an equal footing and speak under that same seal. That's very interesting. I'd be on I'd the be, other side of the issue. 
I would love to explore that. I actually reached out during the meeting and tried to see if that was possible. I had no response, but there might be a, a different way in which we can reach out and um, kind of elevate this concern that we have, because I think it's extremely valid. I, I definitely think it's an uphill battle as well. Um, I did a little background research. Man, the name is eluding me. It's slipping my mind. But what, what was that? Uh, the the uh the name of the woman who is the diplomatic um liaison to to denmark what and i forgot carla, that visit. Carla what was name? sands carla sands yes yeah her late husband was jewish actually i, I did some background mm -hmm. research in her so i don't i don't necessarily say in all cases that that um, is going to introduce some bias but I believe in this case she has an incredible level of bias right we probably aren't even aware of this type of allegiance that she has and I notice sometimes with religion it can you can develop this unbreakable allegiance right so she will probably you know would fight to her last breath to keep this practice persisting and represent the the jewish side of the um coin here in the best way that she possibly can and that might not be fair of me to say but that's in the, at this moment in time that's what i believe right she's going to suppress our voice as much as she possibly can and elevate the voices of people who um want this practice to persist and especially the jewish voice and we're not going to have the representation that we deserve and i've already been down this path unfortunately to be honest with you in which i tried to interface with um city and county officials in the in the, in the region that i lived in and in, in washington state and i actually got pretty far i spoke with elected officials um it, it was really a you interesting process to to see this um play out in real time but it it was like uh you know first you reach out and you you get a um executive assistant or somebody responsible for speaking with um citizens who have concerns and you get past that gate right it's like you turn a key you say the right things and you get to the next person on the list before you can speak <laughs> with an elected official and i played that game right uh, uh, the first couple of times i totally screwed up and and i didn't know what to say i didn't know how to unlock that gate um, but finally I kept persisting and I would, you know, we'd have zoom calls even because you couldn't actually, because of COVID, you couldn't actually go into the, um, the, the areas themselves where typically these meetings would happen. And so I'd have these zoom calls with these executive assistants and other assistants and, and people responsible for hearing citizens concerns before the elected official would. And it was just like a fascinating product because you have to say exactly the right things to get to the next person. And so I'd try and I'd fail and then I'd try and I'd fail. And then finally, I'd figure out the game that you have to play to, to get your concern heard. And eventually, I spoke directly with elected officials. And really, what they said at the end of the day was very concerning to me. Um, first of all, it was that they had an agenda already, like not an agenda is in a is, is like an inherently negative thing, but an agenda of items that they had to address. And my concern was not even in that queue, right? It's it's way far off in the distance. And they have all these other things to address like racial equity. Um, and this whole other litany of, of concerns and that I wasn't th this concern would have to wait. And I definitely felt that that was obviously completely unfair, especially after I conveyed the gravity of the situation. I was like, guys, this is this is a atrocity that's being committed here. And I was able to, you know, really break down X, Y, Z reasons why why I believed it to be this way. And at the end of the day, like they they heard me out. Right. But they did not believe that this was worth um addressing but i think it was much larger than that and that they knew that addressing this they had only had to lose and nothing to gain right they had, mm -hmm. would lose this is this is so controversial to address and um not much of the general public would support them on this so they were not really interested in engaging with me any further and said that if they first of all and another excuse they used was that this is more for state legislators and not for um 
city and county officials, which kind of is a fair point. But what I noticed is oftentimes the city and county officials would elevate concerns to state legislators. So they would like promote something that they believed in, right? They'd be like, we need to address this. And they promote that to state legislators um, and elevate concerns to state legislators. So they just had no interest in, in dealing with this. And I really got some sympathetic people that were like, you know, this is a serious issue. Um, but they didn't believe that it was, it, it was worth the time of day to address right now. And that, that was really, really concerning for me because the things that they were addressing, um, I believed were n paled in comparison to what I was looking to address it. So yeah, cutting cats claws, declawing cats, possibly. Sorry, what? Like uh, outlawing, declawing cats, or cutting dogs' ears. Yeah, no, that wasn't necessarily on the agenda ne specifically, but I, I do see those initiatives being um, put forward. And to be a hundred percent honest with you, my personal opinion is I do support that in my own right. But um, you know, the fact that we can't outlaw infant circumcision and that that actually is on some city and county um agendas is is ridiculous right it's totally unfair right. it's like you get to that point where you, you make all your arguments and you're pretty coherent and your message is conveyed but you, you come to the end of the line and it's like oh you you, you get shut down anyways because the yeah. general public thinks you're you're not good enough or you're not important enough to deal you, with you know, a lot of people say that like rioting and being out in the streets and being aggressive is not the right way to go with intactivism. But I noticed in my city or the city I used to live in, Seattle, it was actually really effective. Like the Black Lives Matter movement or people associated with that or people associated with racial equity and racial justice, they would like go out in the street and protest this uh, very aggressively mm -hmm. and, you know, riot. And geez, guys, the city officials like bowed down at their feet, <laughs> right? Completely, like they, they'd get in these city meetings. I would join them because I was trying to like, I was like that one guy in there trying to elevate infant circumcision as a concern. And I was listening to their pitches and what they were saying and what needs to be done. And there was no diplomacy really at all. Cer cer certainly some people were right. Very diplomatic, very well-spoken, but a ton of people were not and just like railing them right telling these city officials they were just utter trash a stain on their shoe and it was really effective like these city officials did things that i thought were crazy like elevated an ex-pimp they put an ex-pimp on their payroll <laughs> paying him over a hundred thousand dollars a year and his job seems to be just to critique the city he just goes around criticizing the city getting paid a hundred thousand dollars um uh a year or more i think it's honestly more than that and that's his only job is he just kind of reviews the city's uh racial equity um policies and things like that and he's getting and he's on the city's payroll and i'm like guys i'm trying i have a serious concern i'd like to elevate here um can we can we focus on this issue too instead of elevating ex pimps to, to being on the city's payroll getting paid literally just to critique you guys right um it's not like does medicaid oh excuse me i mean racial issues do matter but like it's like i mean we have issues too i mean it's like yeah and so as a white person I'm, as a white male it's like it's tough i mean it's like, tough right now to in... even to even convey this message is like putting myself out there like for cancel culture to just like roast me or whatever Right. Yeah. And so that's how that's how I feel right now. I feel like because of the color of my skin and the gender that I am, um, I am not being given as much attention within the social justice realm or within the equity realm or something like that. Like they're just like, you are the most privileged person to ever walk this earth and you are not deserving of this um, platform that has been created that allows people to mm -hmm. elevate citizen concerns and i genuinely feel that way like if someone wants to come and roast me and cancel me 
because I'm saying these things, then that's the way it's going to be because I'm genuinely just speaking my mind here right now. I mm -hmm. understand what sexism is and I understand what racism is because I genuinely feel like a victim of it. When I have gone to try and elevate these concerns um, within the social justice realm, there is no place for me. Mm -hmm. There is no there is no space made for me at all. And it, it's it's almost as comical for them. The people responding to me, they look at what I want. They they know as soon as they see me, I feel like they make a judgment. They pass a judgment the minute that they see me and they're not willing to give me the, the time of day that that I deserve because of the color of my skin and the gender that I am. And there are all these assumptions that are made about what my why I'm doing this, what my purpose is. Um, mm -hmm. And I just do not I, I feel that way. And if I'm wrong, you know, please somebody tell me and um, let's have a conversation about this. Because that's those are the genuine feelings that I'm experiencing when trying to engage on this issue um, with individuals that are responsible for elevating c citizens' concerns within the social justice realm. They have no, there's no place for me to do that right now. Yeah, um, and so while I think elevating, I think giving everybody the time of day is very very important. What I experienced in my city was what I believe to be um, inappropriate, first of all, use of funds to, you know, I don't believe they put the money and the time in the right place in a lot of instances in my city of Seattle. I think that these people definitely should have had the time of day. And in many cases, I supported them. But um, when I saw that this individual was put on the city's payroll, who I in no way believe should have been on the city's payroll at the same time concurrently when I was trying to elevate my concern and have you know funding and research and analysis put into my concern, it was devastating for me psychologically. I was like, I'm paying taxes in this city um, to address you know to to address not you know for a lot of reasons, but one is to, address concerns that citizens have and you know first of all i felt like they were mismanaging the funding that they were getting and, and second of all i felt like the fact that they there was no place for me to elevate my concern was just it was um crippling psychologically for me because i believe that there was a system in place in america that allowed citizens to be heard um and their concerns to be elevated and that there was some type of fair and just policy that would that I expected to happen, especially since I saw all around me these other social justice groups getting elevated just instantly. They just walked in the door and bam, at the very top, where for me, that was not the case at all. I met resistance all along the way. And then at the very end of the day, they said, no, we can't, we're not going to help you do anything. So we're going to walk away and that's the end of the story. And I saw all around me issues, you know, being promoted and being taken to the highest level. And this extremely severe issue, this atrocity, this probably the greatest systemic human rights violation, systemic human rights violation being done in the United States, right? That's literally being promoted by um, authority figures and widely being propagated um, this needs to be addressed. Like you don't have to make a policy change on this right away, but you need to do an investigation into this. You, this isn't just, you know, I've elevated, I'm making a major claim here. I'm they, saying they that children in mass they, are being mutilated. All right, I'll stop. Yeah. They, they don't want to tally the numbers. They, <clears> they, do, they, they do not want to <throat> do an account for it because they, if that, the accounting is done, and the secondary complications are accounted for, and the financial cost is is figured out. It, it will put it all in focus, and they they do not want to track the numbers. They know this. I actually don't know how much they really know, to be honest with you. I I think they're primarily thinking maybe maybe that's the case. I honestly think most people just put this in the far recesses of their mind. They don't want to address this. This used to be the case for a lot of issues like 
racial equity issues, right? Maybe a politician here this wants to say out in one ear, out the other, right? Oh, well, I'm not necessarily thinking about politicians don't necessarily know that, but the the insurance companies and the medical industry that profits from this understands it, where their vulnerabilities are. And when when they're going to reach a culpable, a, a consequential critical mass to where it hits them in the wallet, they're, they're aware that that's a, a looming problem. And I imagine that the the amount of pressure the intactivists have put on people like Andrew Friedman and others on the AAP um, board to review circumcision policy, it's probably hard for them to get someone to volunteer be on another review committee. I would imagine. I wouldn't put it past them to put together another review committee. The but I hear you. I, I bet it's increasingly becoming more unlikely. Right. Uh, I would, if I was a doctor, I would not. I would not want to be on the next review committee just because uh, there's, there's nothing to gain from it because they're not getting paid for it. They're a trade organization. I think right. a, a slow investigation like the truth and reconciliation thing would be so amazing for this issue because like even to begin like on the reparations like is unfathomable so like just trying to understand that aspect would be like super beneficial I think for people I don't even know like how Americans would start doing this or like you know get their local officials to be on board with it but i think it would be a great yeah. idea you know i think this is a good first start is um having these types of conversations putting these podcasts out there and in addition you know a lot of the things we say right now are really controversial especially where i'm coming from um and unfortunately, in this cancel culture right now, it is um, it's scary to say the things that I'm saying. And I'm worried about putting my voice out there and things like that. I think a lot of men are, are in the same position is that, um, you know, we need to be able to communicate the level of violation that this is and convey the gravity of the situation to people while still trying to remain, you know, still looking to remain diplomatic and and things like that but you know this was an incredibly violent act that was inflicted on us and you know when i say the word atrocity there's a lot of context behind that and meaning behind that and so to begin putting this out there is is really difficult right now and i would love an environment where what you say at one moment, like, and also at the same time, like I can say the wrong thing that necessarily is something I don't agree with a hundred percent, but in the moment, um, you know, that's, that's where my head was at. And then that can come to haunt me 10 years later or five years later, or months later, or weeks later, or something like that. I don't believe in that at all, at all. Um, as human beings, like our thought process, our minds, you can be one person in one moment and literally a moment later be completely different. Yeah, I think um, part of it is like drama and like people just want shit to talk about and they're looking for things to gossip on and it's, it's right. like sort of that thing. And so at the same time, while I think that, um, you know, these individuals that are committing genital mutilation on children need to be called out. At the end of the day, I want to move forward with them i don't i don't want their whole lives to be canceled even though i have extremely strong feelings and think that there needs to be a restorative justice process in place um i want to move forward with everyone involved in this um and i that's more of a philosophical thing but i won't, would like to pursue that same situation with anyone i encounter with any injustice really you know certain instances really require um a different type of punishment but um on this issue where my head's at right now is 
I want to just move forward past this um, with, with everyone involved. And now, you know, the next day that could totally completely change and I could feel much different. But moving forward requires uh, a component of restorative justice um, and some involvement on any individual that was associated with, with this practice. Um, you know, just kind of moving forward, like I said, with a policy change and an apology is, is not enough. It's not even, it's actually insulting if that's, if that's all they're going to implement. It's like a slap in the face mm -hmm. um, and it's not acceptable. I think- Well, Carter? Oh, yeah. Man. No, you go ahead. Carter, there was a thing in the Vietnam War where when, when it was pretty much clear that, that it was gonna wind down and we were just gonna try to extricate ourselves, honorably as possible and not have it be as as devastating of a political defeat and um that it was was who who wants to be the last person to die for a loss for a lost cause or a meaningless war there there's going to be a time to where there's going to be one last boy that's mutilated this way and i I just wonder how this process will go down. Will there be when the law is passed or there's a judicial decision made, they're going to set some arbitrary date and people are going to be rushing, trying to be <laughs> hurry up and get their son cut wow. before the moratorium. That would be you know, absolutely envision, horrifying. I can envision that. Yeah, I can envision this dystopian event when uh, judges or some rational judges make a decision and they, they establish an arbitrary date that this will be the, at 12 o'clock midnight that anyone cut after that time, they're to be held accountable as the malicious crime of mayhem mutilation that it is. Hopefully by I... then, like the public opinion would like be so distasteful of people that do this that like, if you do this, like you'll look down upon your neighbor, you know, there's still people that would probably get it done, unfortunately, uh, especially within the religious realm, right? Because that is um, more of a commandment, you know, that they believe than, and, and that really takes precedence over the social cost and things like that. Um, but there's a lot, most people would stop immediately. Right, most people would respect the law and respect what the law is going to be, and respect that this is now viewed as something much different. And you know, also that would really change their mindset on if the, that they consider this permissible. Because right now, the majority of people that find this permissible do so because the authority figures um, have created that environment, and so they're just going, they're just making their opinion based on what the authority figures um that they respect have sided with so when you go and search this online or when your physician is telling you that this this has all this all these benefits the fact that they're even hiding this as a service conveys an, a sense of authority that this is a legitimate thing that you can do so i think way before it's criminalized the medical community is going to distance itself from it Right, and say we're not we're not performing penile modifications on juveniles anymore without you know dire medical needs so you're not going to be able to just routinely ablate your infant son's genital tissue um without you know very serious reason um so i i definitely get what you're saying though that's an interesting question the, the last day um i think also what's going to happen is many parents even if they're interested in doing this are going to be pretty reluctant because a legal framework is going to exist in which the men can then go and pursue criminal charges against their parents. So on that last day, because that probably is going to be the case, it's going to be, you know, this has to get a Congress. If we want a federal ban, it has to go through Congress. It has to go then to the president and he has to sign like an executive order, right? Or he has to sign the bill. And so there will be probably an official day in which this is criminalized federally. Just like, I don't know if you guys know, there's an FGM bill that was just passed by Congress and is 
I think, you know, at the president's doorstep, ready to be signed. Yeah, wow. sponsored by Sheila Jackson Lee. Are you kidding? Yeah. I didn't even know that. Yeah, and so this potentially could be signed. And how sexist is that, right? We're well, right I, I now. Think it's, I, you think it's what? It's a good thing, man. It's a great thing. Because this is creating the Maybe. foundation for a 14th Amendment challenge, equal protection clause. They tried this once before as you well know, probably. And there was a, the Daudi Bora, uh, I think the name of the sect, which was doing the ritual clitoral glands pricking of in Michigan from Pakistan, was being prosecuted. And Alan Dershowitz joined the case and formulated an argument that it was a state's rights issue to regulate female genital cutting. And Judge Friedman threw out the case and overturned the previous federal legislation. So I don't okay. know about the language of this particular bill. I haven't read it, but they must have restructured the language to where that they thought it would pass judicial muster hmm. and if they did that correcting their language in the bill the fgm law may make a more sounding foundation for an equal protection yeah challenge. i absolutely agree it just i i absolutely agree with what you're saying it just feels sexist right so it just when they're elevating this concern for women only mm -hmm. i just i it's a feeling i don't know maybe I could accurately describe it right now, but um, I feel like I know the burden of sexism yeah. and it sucks. I know, I understand. I understand what sexism is because I feel like a genuine victim of it. And if anyone wants to drag my ass through the mud and mock me for that and belittle me for that, then I'm ready. I'm, I'm genuinely ready for that. I'm ready to say, like raise my hand up and say, I am a victim of sexist policy decisions that seriously impact me in the community that I want to live in. I totally feel the same way. So, and it is a, it is a suffering that I feel really when I see that FGM bill being elevated and I'm trying, right. I'm trying to engage with elected officials and trying to hear them out and none of them support me and all of them support this, which is literally a bill that's criminalizing excision of genital structures from women and then completely leaves out men it's the same it's it's the same pursuit i don't want my genital structures excised the same this is the same thing for women but they're leaving out men this is the this is the pinnacle of sexism this is the <laughs> highest violation of sexism yeah it's the it's most insane. clear example the most clear it, 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 it feels like an assault on me. I feel like a, a gun is being held to my head. It's attacking the male sex organ, which is, right. we know it has estrogen receptors in it, and it func functions similar to a nose, and they don't understand why, why these pheromones are there. But when the foreskin's inner, in, you know, innervated and exposed and that open mucosal tissue is intermingling with the female partner's pheromones. There's, there's subconscious and real biological bonding there that's yeah. being interrupted because of that allicing over and sure. sealing that mucus. Membrane. Sure. There's I, a reason you know, that, I... that, um, that we have these light touch sensors yeah there's a reason that humans kiss that these feelings on our lips so we kiss yeah and i've read a little bit about what you were speaking about and i'm i think it's exploratory research but i'm i definitely want to learn more about that myself and want and want to see academic papers that are published in that realm but I think a lot of, you know, this bonding process and pair bonding and things like that, that's an important component of this discussion because I feel like that's been disturbed and muted for me um, personally. But even just my own personal sexual pleasure and enjoyment without even a partner involved, right? 
that's important as well. And I think many men are uncomfortable and say, you know, don't want to talk about themselves or don't. And I'm not saying you're doing this, but they don't want to make this about themselves. But I believe that's that's um, not really I don't agree with that necessarily. It's OK to be to want something for yourself or to be even self-centered in this regard. Um, I want I, I wanted this for myself. I wanted to have the full spectrum of sexual experience and sec and sexual um, feeling on my body for myself. Not for and for many other reasons as well. But I wanted that personal joy that was ripped from me. And I, I would. Said... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. And well, I'm not embarrassed to admit that, right? I'm not embarrassed to say that this is well, about me. Little intact boys like myself, I'm intact. The foreskin is uh, a point of interest. And I never really examined it myself and understood the sensitivity that, that I had there. So that sensitivity that a boy has in his foreskin lends him to tug on it and naturally play with it because it's a mobile, really sensitive tissue. Right. Just like a newborn baby uh, ruminates and sucks on their fingers. They're exploring their body and they're reinforce reinforcing these neural connections. And that's what boys do when they're maturing. Right, yeah. Nothing they weird about that. They tug at their foreskin and they play with it. And it's an integral part of self exploration and understanding your own biology. Yeah, that's, absolutely. That's interrupted. It's designed absolutely. to be that way. Yeah. And I, what it's I noticed. Oh, go ahead. It's a, it's a culturally constructed event happening has been adopted by medical industry. I just I just don't think many people are aware of really what's being taken via neonatal infant circumcision here. Um, you know, a li it, terms are used like a little snip of tissue, a little bit, you know, a, a you know, I hear a little snip a lot, things like that. Um, and you really need imagery and graphical imagery to understand. But this is a radical for many men, including myself. This is a radical operation, right? It's not just the centimeters of tissue taken off the top um, of your penis, you know, just the ridge band or something like that, or just a couple millimeters of tissue taken. This is like 70% of the mucosal tissue was taken from me, right? That when my penis is flaccid, it's taut, it's tight. And I've kind of changed that through restoration, which I'm pursuing right now. But when I first started, or before I started, you know, I, I had 70% less membrane tissue than an intact man would have on my penis. So I don't even think many intact men, un men understand that, or maybe where their sensation is coming from as well. I'm curious about that, because how could you if if you were intact, how could you ever think that this is permissible or, or not like actively speak out about that? I, I I don't really necessarily understand that. If you were able to downplay it and say, oh, this is just a little modification or something like that, then it would make, make more sense to me. But if you understood that what's being done um, to many of us, then there's no way to just turn your back uh, on that. I just want to share my experience about this sort of thing because, like, as I was growing up, I I was, like, sexually active and sort of discovering, like, my own body and, like, figuring out what it means to be circumcised. So, like, for a while, I, I was sort of ignorant and I had this dry skin issue and didn't really think much of it. But as I sort of had more sexual experiences, I sort of figured out that I, for a while I thought I was asexual because I didn't really derive any sort of significant pleasure from these activities, like such as masturbation or like sex. But as I sort of like 
got to know myself through this process, I, I realized that, yeah, I am a sexual person, but, you know, like, circumcision has, like, really uh, affected me. And, right. Uh, yeah. I was in the same boat. I mean, it's really like a muting of my sexual response. So uh, it's devastating, right? It's not, I wouldn't be here if, 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 if it was just this minor operation that took a little bit from me, uh, I, I would have, I would never be here, right? And speaking about this, I would, and it, you know, I might consider it a violation, but it wouldn't have devastated my life. Uh, like, like it has in this regard. So, um, and that's, that's the case for a lot of men that I speak with is it's not just that, that, that really begin to understand this. It's not just this minor offense. It's, it's an absolute atrocity that devastates them. Um, oftentimes for, for many years of the rest of their life, um, that, that needs to be commonly understood among the general public is we we've been heinously violated and tortured and the rest of our lives will be impacted by this. And definitely you can restore, which I'm doing. It's probably going to be like an eight year long process for me. I'm not kidding. And it's never really going to regenerate the same properties of the tissue that was removed or things like that. But it's, it's an, it's an adequate substitute. It's just incredibly difficult to even do this process. I struggle uh, doing that restoring every day. Like I just, I hate doing it. it there's nothing, some men, it, it's very therapeutic for them. It's the opposite for me. It's like humiliating and devastating. And um, I, it's uh, psychologically distressing every, every time that I have to begin doing it. Um, so, uh, but I continue doing it because the situation that I'm in is feels so dire. I'm like, God, if I have to go the rest of my life like this, this is not a good place to be in to have that whole, you know, erotic kind of experience be robbed from me for the rest of my life. That's, that's just, that's not really a great way to live your life. And some people might disagree with that and say there's more to life than, than just this, but come on, that's, that's such an important component. Yeah. Um, Anyway, guys, I got to wrap this up. Is there any, if there's anything anyone wants to say, I have a meeting with someone else right now, but, um, um, nothing much. I think skeptic just left, but, um, thanks for joining me. Um, right, I hope right. to host another one of these sometime soon. I'll let you know yeah. about that. All right. Uh, sounds good, yeah. man. Perfect. Take care. All right. Hey, peace out. Peace.